Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. Today I have with me Karen Blair, an artist with the Portland Art Gallery, who is joining us from her studio in Charlottesville, Virginia. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, and hello from Charlottesville. As I was telling you before we came on air, Charlottesville is one of my favorite places. It's uh, I've done a fair amount of visiting there to UVA and done a fair amount of running, and it's actually not that different from Maine in many ways. I absolutely agree with that. The weather is somewhat similar with the exception of the middle of winter and the middle of summer. And where you have mud season, we have allergy season, but both to be endured and each has their charms. And I think that Charlottesville especially has a bit of the artistic college town vibe that is so often found in Maine. That's, that is very true. One of my dear, dear friends from high school actually went to UVA and she was one of the most artistic people that I was and is um, that I know. She actually helped create a book with me to design it and uh, she had architectural training. So I think that the Charlottesville area is certainly coming up with a lot of people who are doing wonderful work. It's a great place to be. And I have a wonderful posse of friends with whom I travel and meet together and paint together. And there's an old joke that when bankers get together, they talk about art. But when artists get together, they talk about money. That makes sense in a weird way. So, well, there are so, always these questions about what kind of brushes are you buying? How much are you paying for shipping? Where do you get your canvases made? There, there's just a lot of nitty gritty that goes on amongst artists. Yeah, that, that actually makes sense to me. So when you're not with artists and you do want to talk about art and maybe specifically main artists and main art, um, what, what do you think about? What do you talk about? I, I loved your show last week and you talked about being such a book addict and that you love to read. And I, you and I share that. So when I am in, in need of a fix, I, I have some go-to books. So Lois Dodd, Reggie Hodges, John Walker. And so I, I have that stack. And then, of course, Alex Katz, Milton Avery, Fairfield Porter. Um, and, you know, the list goes on. But you're kind of nobody if you don't work in Maine at least a little bit. I love it. I love hearing that. And I'm sure that um, the owner of the Portland Art Gallery will also love hearing that. Um, I, 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 I'm so excited. I feel like you and I are kindred spirits with the book sharing. I mean, I could have brought my own stack in here, but several of the books that um, you've brought in, in particular, the Lois Dodd book, are ones that I'm familiar with. And I agree with you. I mean, I think that is... That is such a delicious thing to have the opportunity to do um, when interacting with a book is to open it up and see the wonderful art that's available. Yes, and I think that, well, I'm coming to Maine in July, and I'll be there on July 7th at the gallery. And you have Carlos Gamez de Francisco, is that right? And William Crosby. Paige Eastburn O'Rourke and Julia Einstein. So I'm coming to that opening and following that, I am going up to visit Lois Dodd. So I'm very excited about that. And then I'll go on to Deer Isle to see other friends. So that should be a great trip. And then I'll be back in September for a September 1st opening 
with Cooper Dragonette, Helen Lewis, and Anne Haywood. And so all of you artists that I just mentioned, I'll be there in July, I'll be there in September. Come and tell me who you are. I want to meet as many of you as I can. I love it. That's wonderful. It's a, it's a personal challenge. This way we'll get to hear who actually listens and watches the podcast. And <laughs> we'll know yeah. whether they're paying attention to you, Karen. Taking names. Although, I will have to say now, I, I watched your show on Sunday, and I just want to know, where are Shark and Newt? <laughs> well, Shark and Newt are sitting in the sunshine right now on our porch, because it is finally, the, the summer has finally inched its way up to Maine. And this is where they would, there's no other place they would rather be, hanging out on the porch, Shark and Newt. All right. <laughs> yes, well, they joined us on the last I, podcast. I, and so many questions. But one is, what tranquilizers did you give those dogs? They had the most chill dogs. Well, the funny thing is that they, I think they were so stunned by the fact that we let them into the studio to do a podcast with us, that I think they were afraid that if they actually acted up, that we would put them down and make them go sit outside. So <laughs> that was the only thing we needed to do, was to actually invite them in. Isn't it kind of funny that it worked out that way? Well, they were awesome. Anyone who has not seen the episode don't listen to it. You have to go look at it because you have to see Shark and Newt. Yes, I agree. Absolutely. So you also have a dog, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Ours is not ready for prime time. She is a two-year-old Brittany, and we love her, but she is not making an appearance today. Now, is she still um, learning how to um, exist in polite society? Is that what you're saying? She's a, she's a busy little creature, but as you know, one of the great things about a dog is that they remind you every day of how exciting just waking up and life in general is, and, and oh, there's a leaf falling, and there's a rabbit, and the sun is out, as you said about your dogs, and it's that back to, again, your show, that sense of gratitude and that sense of wonder. So I think a dog is sort of nice to have around for all of that. Yes, it's always amazing to me that our dogs will be sitting looking outside and it seems to me that they're not looking at anything. But then if you look a little bit more closely, there actually is a butterfly that landed on um a plant or there is the wind that's blowing the tree branches around and, and they want to make sure that they're um, aware of what's happening because they also want to defend their castle against any potential intruders. Well, I, I think that observation is important. And while I don't paint on plein air, I I need a certain amount of time outside to gather information. And, and there is always something going on. There is always some event, a shift of the light or a breeze or a fragrance. And right now we have honeysuckle blooming. So it, you just catch the waft. And and it is important to be present for that. That's very true. And when I was running today, we don't have honeysuckle quite yet. We're still in lilacs. But I was running up the hill this morning, and it's exactly as you suggested. There was just the faintest scent of lilacs on the warm air. And it really it served to kind of bring me right back to exactly where I was at that moment. And, and that seems like that's what painting often will do is that capturing of wherever you are at that time and making it available for other people to enjoy in the future. There is that sense of trying to cram all of that into a painting. What you, what fragrances were in the air and what was the wind doing and what was the temperature and these are not necessarily visual elements, but yet they can 
become those in a painting. So, and then I think beyond that, there's that sense of, of editing and the way that perhaps you make a roux that you start with ingredients and then you cook it down to the essence of the thing. And all of that takes place and all of it's important. So, you know, throw it in the pot and then cook it down until you get just what you want. Tell me about this piece that's in the studio with me today. I believe it's called Early Morning Fog. Yes. Um, there is, I think, for artists like photographers, that early morning period or that time at dusk. And what those two times of day create <clears throat> are because of the shift in temperatures, there's often wind or fog. And I think it's important to go out at those times of day and observe those. <clears throat> and I have always loved fog. And we get a fair amount because we're in the mountains, but is that sense of things are revealed and then the next minute they're not there and something else has been revealed and and there's a mystery there and a, and that going back to that idea like the dogs on the porch of waiting and taking that time to breathe and and knowing that with great anticipation that at any moment, something else will pull into view. And, and, and that was what I was after in that painting. I have a, a firm belief in trusting the viewer. And people bring things to paintings when they see them. And I'm always pleased and sometimes surprised and occasionally shocked at what people see in my paintings, but it's all successful because I want to leave space and air and room for people in the same way that maybe one reads a book and, and brings one's own experience into that narrative. Karen, can you give me an example of a time that you were surprised or even shocked by what people were seeing in your paintings? I often have people say they see faces in the paintings, which I don't intentionally put in there, and certainly I don't think subconsciously, but maybe it's just basic human nature that we tend to see a face or a figure um, and that's okay. So, interestingly, when, as you're talking, I think about when I look at birch trees, I will often see faces in the birch trees, and I call them the watcher. Okay, so there you are. And that's a great case in point, yes. I see faces in birch trees, too. In fact, times I, I've skied, when I'm on the lift going up, it's the birch trees that I remember about skiing. It's not the great run or the powder or it's those, those trees with those faces and you're on the ski lift and it's quiet and you're riding. I could just go to a ski resort and ride the ski lift around and around, I think. So maybe subconsciously you, you are bringing the faces into your pieces because you're seeing the faces yourself. You just don't realize you're actually putting them in there. Oh, that's a great observation. And I will totally own that. Well, I'm interested in um, talking to you a little bit about Carl Jung because I read that you have a Bailey Island connection and that people who are followers of Carl Jung also have a Bailey Island connection. And I did not realize that that existed. And I'm, he is someone that I find quite fascinating. Could you tell me more about that? I 
myself am not a hardcore Jungian, and I don't know a lot about it, but I have had friends who made actual pilgrimages to Bailey Island because of Jung being there and working there. I, I find Jung fascinating as well, and it is interesting to me that the notion of putting oneself in a place where a figure of interest, of, of reverence, has been, and that we can absorb some of that same experience. And I do firmly believe that that's a real thing and that all of us are capable of doing that. Yeah, I mean, I think that is something that um, for me has been really important about Maine is is the number of individuals who um, used to be here or still are here who in, engage in creative journeys. Um, Winslow Homer is one, the Wyeth family, all the people that you've mentioned um, previously. And I think that Charlottesville has its own interesting history in that way as well. And one thing I wonder about, and maybe maybe I'm bringing this up and it won't resonate with you, but similarly when I go to places and there have been places where tragedies have occurred, and when I go to the South and the Civil War, for example, I'll go to a graveyard and it's it's filled with Confederate gravestones. I mean, there's actually a sense of almost sadness, a sense of presence um, that exists that I don't know that I would have come up with just kind of reading about the place. Oh, it's very real. It's palpable. You go to places, and Virginia especially is strewn with battle sites, and tens and tens of thousands of deaths, and there is a palpable sense of ghosts and the, the lives that were lost. And I think it could, maybe goes back that maybe our artists are more in tune with that, but I think anyone could be. Um, you know, there are two impulses I find throughout history and throughout time, and that is that we ritually bury our dead and we make art. And I really can't think of a civilization that didn't do those two things. And I think these battlefields maybe go back to that, that we ritually bury the dead and then we honor them in some way. We we create paintings or we write songs or we have memorial services and we wear special clothing. And, and so I think it speaks to a very deep set of impulses in us when we visit those places. So similarly, what happens when we don't have the opportunity to engage in those rituals. I'm thinking about um, just the countless slaves, for example, that came to this country and worked the land, and they don't have monuments to them. We don't even necessarily know where they are. I mean, that that's another piece of all of this that has always kind of caused me to wonder, you know, are, are there, I don't know, let's say, are their spirits less stable? Are they still haunting us in a way because we haven't had the chance to give them a place of um, consecrated ground? I hope that's being addressed. And certainly there are some institutions such as Monticello that are working hard on that. Um, I think as a consequence of no access to art materials, that what has come down to us from our African-American friends is such a great oral tradition with 
the cadence of the ministers and the the music and we owe so much to all of that the great poets the writers so i i increasingly am aware myself of more and more african american artists in this country and certainly that's a wrong that is being righted but i think we can't overlook the strength of the oral tradition Yes, that's actually a really good point. And um, I had the opportunity before he passed away to interview and write a story about Ashley Bryant, who is a Maine artist who happens to be African-American, originally from New York. And even though he is clearly a visual artist, he also did a lot of work with puppetry, for example. And he was certainly a storyteller. So I think you're right that that art is being captured just maybe in a different way. I and I and I'm not trying to ask you to be an apologist for the entirety of, you know, the southern part of the United States just because you happen to live in in Charlottesville. By the way, I just I've pondered these things and and I've wondered if this is something that you've also had the chance to be thinking about yourself. Well, it's it's a part of our fabric and not to acknowledge it would be a fool's errand. It's, it's there. It's not fixed. It's ongoing. We had a horrific incident in Charlottesville not so long ago. And yeah, it's, um, you know, we, it's going to make me sort of cry to talk about it. It's, it's a disgrace really. But I think through art, we have a chance to heal. And a lot of my work goes into hospitals. I think size and color and for various reasons. And I get wonderful letters or emails from people saying, I was taking my mother for her cancer treatment. And there was your painting. And it took us out of ourselves for 10 minutes. And and maybe, you know, we have a chance to do that. That's a really wonderful thing to say. And I think it is very true that we think of hospitals as a place of healing the body. But when we put art in hospitals or other places of, of healing, it gives perhaps the opportunity for healing the soul or the spirit. And so it is very important, the work that you're doing that that puts those pieces in front of people. Well, thank you for saying that. And you as a doctor would be so aware of that. It's, um, yeah, I I took my own daughter for a, a very bad cancer diagnosis and she has been through chemo and surgery and is doing well. But we came out of the office after a very dire meeting and she looked down the hall and said oh mom i feel right at home there was one of my big paintings so that those little moments in life to you know celebrate take a breath appreciate say okay you know let's get a grip here we just need to go paint we just need to go write a book we need to do whatever it is that feeds our soul Yeah, I I couldn't agree with you more. I I know that one of the things that has enabled people to come through COVID and we're still going through COVID is is the chance to interact with the creative spirit whether it's um you know through a piece that you've painted or whether it's a, a song that somebody has created or whether it's even writing something myself. I know that it's it's, it requires some level of um, openness, though, that, I th- that has been sometimes hard to come by with COVID. Oh, it's, I mean, first of all, artists, it's such a solitary life that we were all about to turn into unibombers. I mean, here we were, no contact, by ourselves all day. And yes, I, the way that my grandparents talked about the depression. They would never waste food. 
we will talk about COVID and we will never waste fellowship. Yeah, I, I think it's it's so true that this sense of great isolation that was forced upon many people as a result of COVID has really caused us to appreciate the other side of things and the opportunity to connect with one another. Oh, absolutely. It is such a joy just to be able to gather. A group of us just went to Baltimore to the Joan Mitchell painting show. And we were just giddy. I mean, you know, we even from the moment we got on the train to go, it was nonstop, just excitement over the chance to physically be together and to be unmasked. It's not the same with the mask on. And I of course, artists are visual people, so we lose so much. I think we all do when when people are masked. Yeah, I, I think that's true. It's it's having spent the last two plus years working in a brand new organization, I didn't get to know very many people before we all started wearing masks, and uh, we're still wearing masks because we're in healthcare, but and we probably will be for quite a long time. But it's always fascinating when I then get on a Zoom call and I'm like, oh, that's what the bottom half of your face looks like. And it's, <laughs> and you can tell a lot with some looking at somebody's eyes. But I, it, it's, it's so strange to have this kind of veil over uh, a significant part of our body that is used for expression and to know what that's going to look like in a few years when we come out on the other side. Yes. And I, I think about children who are learning speech at this time, and there's just a lot of things I think we'll never get back. So, yes, we need to get together. I'm so excited about coming to Maine twice this summer because I haven't been in a few years because, of, as we say in, in the South, the COVID, we have not been able to do those things. And, of course, I have yet to meet all of the wonderful people at the Portland Art Gallery. And so, so far, we, we're just pen pals. Well, that's good. It's the best kind of pen pal to have. It's a very friendly group. So when you finally get to meet them, I think you'll be very pleased. I have never met anyone from Maine who wasn't friendly. Uh, it just seems to be in the air up there. And I don't know if every winter's COVID, a mini COVID, and spring comes and people are just so glad. Oh, you made it through the winter. I, I'm not sure what it is, but people are so friendly. Yes, we're all basically a bunch of daffodils. If the snow finally clears and we're able to spring up and show our faces again, there we are. So yes, it's very true. We are a resilient bunch and happy for the sun for sure. So tell me about what you'll be doing this summer to prepare for your September show. I'll give you a little, let's see if I can get this around, a little peek here in the back. I don't know if you can see. Um... If there's a main painting behind me, um, can you see right back behind me over my shoulder? And maybe all the way back, there's one. Yeah. So, you know, I've got main on the brain. I am um, working toward that. I might be able to get you a little bit more into are you following me is this work okay i'm gonna turn this around to the studio how about that so so this is main i'm working on and over here main and over here, main. And those are perhaps a bit more uh, realistic, but I'm also working on some maybe less obvious. Things. 
So there is definitely some stuff going on that's gotten in my mind about Maine, and I am I, I love when that happens because I tend to work in series, and I like to take something you know as far as I can go with it. So yes, there will be. There will be some rocks, there'll be oceans, there'll be all kinds of things. Well, Karen, I am, uh, I'm, it, it's been a very delightful conversation with you. you. This is the first conversation I've had with an artist who has not only shown me their studio, but also their backyard and their garden and their projects. So I really appreciate your, your spending time with me and being Thank willing to do so this. Thank you so much. This is fun. I can't wait to meet you live and in person in July. Live and in person, absolutely. I've been speaking with artist Karen Blair, who will be visiting Maine at least once this summer and then again in September for her show. And I hope that people will take the time to learn more about her work online at the Portland Art Gallery website and then also have a chance to uh, meet with her and talk with her as I have. You are a delightful person, Karen, and it's been my pleasure to have this conversation with you today. I'm Dr. Lisa Belisle, and this has been Radio Maine.